So this session is discussing uh, Apache Tomcat and Spring Boot and how the two interact. Um, the original uh, submission for the paper was, you know, what is the interaction between Tomcat and Spring Boot? And as I researched that over the last few months, uh, I mean, obviously I've been using Spring and, and Tomcat for a long time, but as I researched the actual interaction between the two source projects uh, and, and the source code commonalities, uh, it's very, very little that actually, uh, that actually is duplicated between the two projects. So there is an inclusion of Tomcat libraries inside of the Spring Boot libraries. But as far as actual implementation of things, uh, it's very light. Uh, it goes for all of the containers that are implemented in Spring Boot. Um, my name is Andrew Carr. I've been developing Java applications since the early 2000s. Uh, I started writing software in 1996 um, when I was 16, and uh, I wrote software for a way station to convert column input from a scale to a terminal. And ever since then, I've been hooked. I've done a lot of things over the years, as I'm sure we all have. Uh, but I've always come back to Java. Uh, Tomcat, Java, and Spring have been in the core of my, uh, I guess, my professional concentration. Uh, right now, I work as an enterprise architect uh, consulting, uh, contracting enterprise architect uh, for uh, a few companies that uh, hire me on an as needed basis. So we have like an open, ended service contract. Uh, so uh, I'm going to switch over here to this other slide presentation right here uh, for just a second. And I apologize. I thought I'd shut off all of my notifications. Uh, this is a brief history of Tomcat. Um, obviously, you might have been beat over the head with this, so this is only, I'm only going to go over this for about 60 seconds, um, maybe two minutes. Uh, but Tomcat started as a project at Sun Microsystems. Uh, James Duncan Davidson is the original father of Tomcat, although Mark and Chris might have, uh, might have contributed more at this point to Tomcat than uh, James Duncan Davidson did originally. The original reference, reference implementation of Tomcat was done in 1996 by James Duncan Davidson at Sun Microsystems. Um, he was the key evangelist for contributing the project to the open source uh, uh, community, and he's the main reason why Sun donated the project to the open source community in 1999. Um, so you saw the release of Tomcat with support for Server 2.2 in 1999 and around the end of 99, early 2000. And it started blowing up from there. Uh, right after that, uh, we saw the next release was a huge jump, the Server 4.0 uh, from the earlier Server models. I'm sorry, Servlet 2.4 from the earlier Servlet 2.2. Um, and then from there, Tomcat just exploded in the community. Uh, we saw the release of 5 and 5.5 right on the heels of 5 because of some of the memory issues with Java 5, JDK 5, uh, and uh, the leaks that were occurring. Um, and so after 5.5, it really became a reliable production tool that you could employ uh, confidently. Uh, and also 5.5 introduced the uh, ability to run the JDK without, uh, I'm sorry, to run Tomcat without running a JDK. You could run just a JRE. So it became even more lightweight. Um, and then in the last few years, we've seen, you know, this rapid growth, the, the rapid deployment of servlet specification versions. Uh, we're at servlet specification 5 right now in Tomcat 10, which is not a GA yet. Uh, but uh, if you think about the first 10 years of Tomcat, how we went from Servlet 2.2 to 2.4 to 2.5 to 3, uh, Servlet 5 is a big jump. 
Um, but that's where we're headed. Uh, and servlet four is uh, is much much better than the original server. So servlet 3.0, we saw the introduction of annotations and uh, web XML less applications, uh, configure configure less applications. Uh, so it really started to uh, take off, uh, especially around the release of servlet uh, 3.0. Let's see. If I hide my no. If I maybe if I hid my video, you'd be able to see this code that we're going to look at better, but that's okay. Um, so Spring Boot. So Spring Boot is a prototyping application. Uh, it's it's not necessarily a prototyping application, but it, it originally served as a prototyping application. Uh, and here at the end, we'll do a prototype, and I'll show you how quickly you can create a prototype and deploy it into a Tomcat container in a production-like environment. But uh, if you want to prototype an application, uh, Spring Boot was pretty much the best way to do it uh, at 10 years ago or eight years ago. Now, you know, with Node and some of the other frameworks out there, it might be arguable that um, maybe Spring Boot's not the fastest way to prototype an application anymore or the best way. But if you are going with Java, then uh, Spring Boot is definitely one of the fastest ways to prototype a Java web application. I should be a little more specific. Obviously, we're talking about a swing application. You're not going to be, uh, you're not going to have uh, as much uh, benefit from Spring Boot. Although you could use Spring Boot in a Swing application to implement things like JPA uh, and uh, other functionality. Uh, sorry, I got distracted by Christopher's comments there. Um, and Spring Boot implements uh, Gradle and Maven. So whenever you create your project, you can either use Maven or Gradle. Or They also have Ant support, uh, surprisingly, although you shouldn't be using Ant. But if you do, uh, there are... Uh, add-ons that the community wrote that have been implemented in Spring Boot to support AMP builds. Uh, how does the Spring component of your Spring Boot framework with the Tomcat engine work? Uh, it basically has a class that uses the Spring application to run your core of your application. Uh, the core doesn't necessarily need to be anything complex, especially if you're uh, starting from the initialized model that uses the Spring Boot parent object as the uh, parent of your application. So it implements all of the base functionality for you, and you basically start uh, with just a symbol class. Um, the configuration is all automated, although it is highly customizable, um, and it comes with embedded Tomcat by default. Um, and that's really what we care about here is the core of this Spring Boot implementation is the Tomcat web container. Um, to configure the embedded Tomcat, I've got some source examples here, but I don't want to get too bogged down at the beginning in some examples. Uh, let's switch over to the demo application briefly. The demo application example, just like we said, was, let's make that a little bit bigger, apologies. Here we go. The demo application uh, calls the spring application run, as was mentioned in the slide. And the Spring application launches our container that contains Apache Tomcat, and it spins up our web application. This is all you need to start your Tomcat container, by the way, basically. You don't need anything more than this. You can see that the Spring container is launching via the uh, demo application class. This is the demo application class. This is a completely contained Spring application. Uh, this is not, however, a Spring class. Uh, but we will discuss a few more uh, bits of functionality. The example here in the slide is a REST controller, which uh, if you're not familiar, controller obviously is an endpoint that handles incoming web requests and returns a web response. Um, it uh, allows for, the annotation allows for the 
wiring behind the frame, uh, behind the scenes, so you don't have to handle uh, connecting a route or uh, mapping paths. Uh, you still, you know, you might want to configure external filters uh, or request handlers, but as far as the actual re request mapping, all you need to uh, accept a request into your application is this annotation uh, with that request mapping path, and you'll be able to uh, listen for incoming requests. Uh, configuring the embedded Tomcat is pretty straightforward, especially if you use an intelligent IDE. Uh, the, the application property values are available in the Spring Boot documentation. Spring I.O. is one of the best sites uh, as far as documentation is concerned. If you're familiar with open source projects, you know that the documentation can suffer. Uh, however, Apache Tomcat, Apache Web Server, and Spring I.O. are probably three of the best documented sites that uh, I've used. Uh, Maybe uh, Web, uh, Wildfly, and JBoss are right there with it. Uh, but with Wildfly and JBoss, you have Red Hat behind that. You don't have that behind Tomcat, and still Tomcat has excellent documentation. Uh, so we had a question. Uh, I have an example actually of the war style web application that we want to, that we're going to deploy at the uh, end here. If we get to it, I'm going to try and do that. It's very easy to deploy it. Obviously, you don't want to run an embedded Tomcat instance in most cases in production. Uh, so here's the basic uh, settings as we get to them. However, if you go into your initialized application in your Spring project, if you create a file called Application Properties and you have autocomplete enabled, you should be able to view the settings that come uh, out of the box to configure your Tomcat instance. Uh, and you can see that there are a number of settings that you can configure. And we'll get back to uh, configuring a few of those. Um, so here I'm going to launch the embedded Tomcat uh, and compare the configuration of embedded Tomcat versus the configuration of standalone Tomcat instance. Uh, as you can see on the left side there, we've got the server.xml from the uh, Tomcat 9 release, I believe, or Tomcat 8 release. Um, that shows the uh, global naming resources, the service, Catalina service container that contains your executor thread pools, your endpoints for your HTTP connector, your AGP connector, uh, the Catalina engine, and other things. Uh, obviously, the access log. Uh, that's the configuration that Spring Boot is going to use by default. Let's switch over here. My apologies, I've gotten lost in my. Um, so if we go into our project, maybe we can get to our projects. There we go. Obviously, we're not going to have much time for a lot of demos, but here we have a demo application that was checked out from the Spring repository. Uh, I don't believe this one was created necessarily with the initializer, uh, but to run our application with the embedded Tomcat container, we're simply going to execute Maven, uh, which is not on my path at the moment. So we'll update my path to include Maven really quick. Uh, path and let's throw Maven on there. And let's export the job home. I thought I'd already done this. I apologize. Uh, uh, JDK 8 is not going to be optimal. Let's go with JDK 11. Okay. Uh, so now we run Maven. Uh, after uh, we're using Java 11 in this case, which is one of the features of the new Spring. Boot 2.0. Obviously, if you're on the earlier releases of Spring Boot, you're not going to be able to use Java 11. Uh, let's use Java 11 and let's run the project with the Spring Boot prefix, which is going to call the Spring Boot module. And we're going to pass in the run command to that module. And now we've launched our embedded Tomcat command. Uh, you can see that Tomcat was already running. And uh, let's go ahead and see if we can kill that real quick. 
if we uh, did not mean to leave it running. Ah, uh, yeah, we can see that 69480 is running. It's not important. I'll leave it. We don't have much time. Let's change the port in the configuration so we can launch another instance without overlapping. Let's try again. Maven Spring Boot Run. That's funny because my IDE took the change and updated, I guess. Either way, Spring Boot Run is going to launch our Tomcat container. Uh, if we want to package our container without running Spring Boot, obviously we want to uh, the uh, Mavens get this, I believe, which is also here in your Spring Boot Run action. Let's go back to the slides, one second. Uh, so that's a very basic example. Obviously, that's just launching it in the uh, default container and running the default target with the default configured application, basically. Um, 40 minutes really isn't much time to do examples. Uh, other container options that come with uh, Spring Boot are Jetty, Undertow, and RSocket. Uh, and these are uh, other Java servlet implementations, reference implementations of the servlet specification. Uh, Jetty is the Eclipse project um, that uh, allows you to uh, run your Java servlet in the same method that you run it uh, in Tomcat. Uh, RSocket was developed by Netflix, and it's very fast. It also has a lot of built-in support for reactive uh, programming, Java RX programming. Um, and uh, Undertow is obviously the core of our Wildfly container, the original Wildfly container. Wildfly is crazy. You know, it's on version 22 now. Um, but just a few years ago, when Wildfly 10 and 11 were the mainstream releases, Undertow was your core servlet engine. Now, um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the new one's called, uh, but I don't think Undertow is at the core of Wildfly anymore. Uh, but either way, those are your options. You've got your, your Java servlet, uh, your servlet specification implementations of other containers included with Spring Boot, so you don't have to go with Tomcat. Obviously, we're going to stick to Tomcat because uh, that's what the core of this talk is about. Some uh, important settings that you're going to want to look at whenever you are uh, configuring your embedded container. Uh, this is obviously not for the, uh, the external container. This is just for your embedded Tomcat container. The port number, as you saw me change in the IDE just a minute ago, uh, in application properties, you can change the port of the deployed container. Um, we've got our max threads, uh, which was, uh, uh, that's a Spring 2 setting, Spring Boot 2 setting. Uh, it used to be uh, some other setting, but now it's server.tomcat.threads.max. Um, and you want to set that to about 600 if you're running production. Uh, you can leave it on the default of 200 if you're not running this, if this is just a development instance. Uh, swallow size, form post size, and request size are very important to control. Uh, access to your application by users wanting to upload content. If you have an application that you uh, are uh, receiving content from the end users, you're going to have to update those settings to allow for uh, the max request size. Because as soon as they try to upload something that's larger than one meg, it's going to fail. And you're going to say, why? Uh, the logs are in the newer versions of Tomcat and Spring, the logs are much clearer. When you hit the max request size, now it actually says that. Uh, in the older days, it, it didn't necessarily make it as clear, but normally you'll get an error that says uh, we've received 
uh, a file that's larger than the max request size. Uh, and again, we've got the uh, completion here uh, for our spare threads, our max threads, our upload size, our request size, which is crucial for configuring your application. Uh, so you want to set this in bytes, and we would want uh, 19 megabytes for the maximum size instead of the default of one. And we would want 10 spare threads instead of the default of four. Uh, and this would update the configuration of our server. Uh, and that's all there is to it. That's going to look with those new configurations. Uh, now, there are some ways you can also pass JVM options through this configuration, although the embedded container is not as customizable, obviously, as the, uh, the external container. Uh, there is a load path options that allows you to pass in supposedly any command line D options that you would normally pass into the JVM, but I've not had a lot of luck getting it to work. Uh, some people have claimed that you can pass in the options directly through this. That does not work, definitely. But if you do the load, uh, I'm sorry, loader path option, and you pass in the XMX equals 2G, that should set your uh, heap size to your embedded container to 2 gigabytes. I've not gotten it to work. Uh, there's a lot of debate on it. It could be because I'm on the newest version of Spring Boot, and that is an older uh, parameter. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, that'll have to be tested. However, uh, I think the default runs with uh, 1.5 gigs. Uh, so if you're not if you're using more than that in your test environment, then you're probably not going to run want to run it in an embedded container either. You're probably going to want to spin up. A standalone container. Uh, I thought I had a J console. Uh, let's look at the J console uh, really quick. an instance of J console really quick and if we look at our default settings demo application and we look at the VM summary uh, we can see that's interesting I don't think the default is normally that large maybe it pulled it from my Java options Maybe it's a Java 11 thing. It used to be 1.5 gigs. Uh, but here you can see that the default heap, without changing any options, is set to 8 gigs. You definitely want to check that and verify yourself in your local instance. I wouldn't just go with that and say, well, I've got 8 gigs available. Uh, so you're using Spring Boot in production. I believe we had a question about this. Uh, let me jump back to that chat. Um, uh, let's say the question was, let's say I have an existing war style web application and I'd like to convert that into a self-executing thing using Spring Boot. What are the steps? Okay, so maybe that's not the exact same uh, uh, method that I was talking about, but for self-executing, uh, that's along the same lines of what you're going to do. Uh, you're going to want to build your application using Maven or using an IDE. Um, let me jump back over to one I've already done it in to save some time and find it. All right, I've got one right here. Uh, so I've got Maven package to package up my application. That's Maven, obviously, that has nothing to do with Spring Boot. Uh, but I'm going to package my application to generate something that is portable, right? 
uh, install is going to put it in my local repo, repo run or X job execute is going to run it. Uh, package is going to package it up for deployment. The skip test is true, uh, important because if you don't run that, it's going to launch the entire servlet container and uh, you're going to have to wait on that. Uh, so if we look at the target directory, we should see our, our new uh, war file that was just built. And we can, and we see it was built at 120. And that means I'm getting close to being out of time. Uh, but that doesn't have to be a war file, right? Um, so if we move that to a jar file, the only reason it is a war file and not a jar file, which is the default setting, is because I believe I changed it in the Maven file when I built this. Should be packaging at the top, I believe. Yeah. So I changed it to packaging more. We left this on jar. And we ran it again. It should get a jar file. I didn't like that for some reason. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's in the wrong directory. All right, so we look at the target directory. Uh, we see that we have a jar generated. So now I have a self-executable jar file. So if I were to say I uh, want to uh, take that as a packageable tool, like the our, our user requested just a section, second ago, I could say let's send that jar file somewhere, um, demo snapshot.jar, uh, and let's uh, put it on a server uh, as its own self-contained entity. It's going really fast. Let's connect to that server. Okay, that's done. Uh, so you can see I've got my jar file right here. Uh, I might have it already running. I don't. Uh, so I'm going to run Java, make sure it's present. We have Java 11 here, which is the same version that it was compiled with. That's going to be important. And by launching Java jar and the jar file, you can see that it's doing the same thing that Maven did, only we don't have to have our development environment installed. We don't have to have any other tools except Java, the JRE, not the JDK necessarily, and our jar file. So you can, that's a very small package. You know, it's not a self-executing application like an MSI package would wrap your executable and your installation into a Windows package that's one file. Uh, but it is very small and very portable. You don't normally have to transport Java to other containers because almost everything has a JRE on it. My watch has a JRE on it. My phone has a JRE on it. Everything has a JRE on it. So as long as you can put that jar file somewhere, you can easily deploy this container. Now that container is up and running, and you can see that Tomcat started on port 9998. So I'm going to background that task. I'm going to add 9998 to the firewall. 9988 to the firewall, I think. And then if I open a window, now that my firewall is reloaded, I go to dev3, 9988, I should see my application. And you do, in fact, see that the request came through. So that's completely self-contained, and it's a very efficient, fast way of doing it. Um, let's see. In Spring Boot, create an EXE or app bundle or an L. You always need the JRE. There are ways to bundle the JRE and the JAR into a self-executing executable that we definitely don't have time to go over right now. It is not Spring Boot that's going to do it. That's completely separate. You're going to want to look up how to make a Java JAR file into its own self-executing file. Uh, it's completely separate from anything that we're discussing here. Unfortunately, that's as mobile, uh, as modular and reusable as you can get it with uh, an instance of JRE Spring Boot. 
we are running dangerously low on time here. Um, methods of deployment. So that's basically what we're talking about right now are some methods of deployment. Um, the deployment we've done so far has been an embedded deployment. Let's look at how it would differ. You already saw me transfer my jar file over here. A jar file and a war file are very similar in the respect that it is your compiled classes from your, your Java program, the .class files. Uh, wrapped up into a zip archive. Um, now with a web ar application archive, a WAR file, it is uh, it has a, spe a specific structure to it that allows it to be deployed as a web application that a JAR file doesn't necessarily have. Uh, however, as the technology becomes more advanced and automation is more prevalent and scanning of packages is easier, uh, the line between web application and JAR, jar file are becoming a, a a little bit skewed because now with the Spring Boot application, you can drop a jar out there that pretty much is its own web application. But that's for another time. So we have uh, Tomcat deployed on the server that I created in the demo yesterday or the day before yesterday, I believe. Um, and if we look at our status for Tomcat, uh, we see that it's loaded and inactive and it's off. So let's turn it on. switch over to the root user because I don't know what I've done with the configuration right here. Let's try again. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so it is running now. Uh, it started up pretty much instantly because I don't believe there's anything there. And the port's already open from our demo the other day, so you can see that the server is in fact running. Now we take our, uh, let's look at the log file. Uh, leave that running while we do this. And let's take our jar that we just brought over, which is called uh, demo. Our demo 001 snapshot.jar. Uh, let's copy demo 001 to the web apps folder. And for sake of consistency, let's name it uh, demo.war. We should see the deployer pick up the new file and detect the file system change and deploy the application automatically. So it's deployed demo.war. It's not done though. If it deploys the application correctly in the container, you should see the spring context load up as well. And we didn't see that happen yet. I don't believe it Okay. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to troubleshoot why the deployment failed. Uh, there are sometimes things that you might have to do uh, to deploy the application successfully. I believe I've only got five minutes left. Uh, so if there are any questions, please go ahead and type. While I'm waiting on questions, I'm going to uh, Talk about the spring initializer really quick. Spring IO is a great site, by the way. It's got wonderful documentation. It's almost as good as the documentation on the Apache Tomcat site, uh, but I'm definitely more I'm preferential towards the Tommy's uh, Tomcat Tommy E site, actually, both of them. Uh, Start.spring.io is going to be the spring initializer. Let's see if we can do this really fast. Um, so we've got Apache Con demo, right? And we want to add a web dependency. Let's generate it. Uh, you see, I downloaded the demo right here. Let's take it and drop it in our demo folder. Extract it. There's our demo that we just downloaded. Let's open it. This is all you need 
to start the prototyping of your web application. Now we have a spring application that will accept requests and allow you to start creating controllers. We should with minimal configuration. Granted, this is an Eclipse, which a lot of people prefer. Uh, it is IntelliJ, but it's very similar to the configuration in Eclipse. You're going to make sure that you have the right JDK selected uh, for your project uh, and the right uh, language version, uh, which we're going to go with 11, although the new spring does definitely support JDK 15. Uh, people seem to use uh, prefer using JDK 11, especially in production environments. You see a lot more JDK 8, 9, and 11. Um, and you see, so all we did was we went to the Spring Initializer. I typed in the name of the project as, you know, ApacheCon Demo, and it created a project with the ApacheCon Demo package. You see that there. You see the class it created, uh, and I changed the JDK to version 11, and I clicked Run on it. That's all it took. It's very similar in Eclipse. If we had more time, I would go into that. Um, but we are out of time. To add a controller that is available in Tomcat, we would just create a new controller. And we would add the request mapping to it. We would add the controller annotation to it. And then we would add the request mapping. To create a get method that returns a string of a page. And basically, that's all there is to creating a web application using the Spring Initializer and deploying it in the embedded Tomcat container, which you can see here. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have enough time to get into anything else. Um, as you saw, if you want to check on the status of your running Spring Boot application, I suggest you use JVisual VM or J uh, Console to do that. It's very easy to uh, monitor your application in J Console and J Visual VM. You can see my demo application running right there. I'll just hit connect to it. If you want to monitor a remote application in a staging environment, you can expose JMS endpoints with authentication and connect to a remote server in the same fashion. Uh, it's very easy to Google how to do that. I would not recommend enabling these JMX uh, endpoints on production though, even with authentication, the authentication on JMX is a little weak because you know it's a plain text file that there is some encryption, but there is a plain text file with an encoded password in it. So I might not recommend using it in anything that's you know, got HIPAA information or uh, sensitive information on it. Uh, I've, I'm in the Tomcat channel on the Slack, and I am always available via email. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Um, the Open Logic booth is. Uh, can tell you all about our Tomcat support options and uh, how we'd be happy to help any of you. Um, and it's not just me. There are uh, a number, uh, at least 14 other enterprise architects on my team alone, not including you know the hundreds of other employees that work at OpenLogic. And we'd definitely be happy to help you. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much, Andrew.